Here are four of the pastors at our church who participated in their first communion with the new altar table that I built. Here's the table, inlay banding in the apron and on the top. Here's some of the oak lumber we're gonna use for our next altar table. So what we have to do is get some for the apron. So this piece is long enough, but we got a big old knot right there we're gonna to try to work around. And we have another one about right here. So we're gonna rough cut this 44 inches down to just shy of this knot because our final piece is only gonna be 40 inches long. And then we'll take this piece right here for our sides and we'll do 19 inches there. So I have them cut and milled and now I'm ready to resaw them. And so I take it to the bandsaw to make two boards out of one. So now I have these two boards that are going to be the aprons and now I'm cutting dados for our inlay banding. You'll see on the back of these boards a couple of stiffeners that we have glued on to make sure that we're able to keep these boards nice and flat for the banding. These are the aprons to the table. This is the oak board I'm cutting the dado to fit these pieces here. And it has to be a tenth of an inch thick so this can just slightly fit above here so we can sand that flat. So I've cut the outside in the, of the two marks and now I'm just clearing out the in-between for this to sit flush. And I cut this one a little bit short and I'll fine tune that one after I get all this finished. This is what the inlay banding looks like before we slice it into one eighth inch slices and put a backing on it. These are the little spacer pieces that'll go in between these two different styled of inlays cut from two different blocks. The spacers are paduke and also the darker end grain on the squares is also paduke. It's a little bit darker because it's end grain. And the light color is maple. And then in the center for the cross is yellow heart. All of those are in grain as well. And so we have all of our pieces in here laid out to see how they're going to look and make sure we have them in the right order. And then we'll get to gluing them down. So here we are gluing in our pieces of inlay into our dado. And they're down here. We have four pieces glued in and we got eight clamps. And we hope that's enough because it's gonna take a monster. Are we ready? Clamping, we are ready. All right, we have completed uh, our clamp up of half of our inlays with 28 clamps. So if there's ever a situation of not having enough clamps to do a whole glue up, this is it. So the next day, after it's dried, I take off the clamps, cape off the call, and then I have a parchment paper on top of each block to keep it from sticking. Okay, now we got the clamps off. Let's take off the blocks. A little bit of sticking this, I guess. Take off our paper. The second half of this board took 26 clamps to get our pieces glued down. So this is the first half of our inlay. I've done a little bit of sanding on it already. And now we have the second half under glue up. Not everything was perfect. We had one mistake in our glue up and we had to take out two panels and replace them. This is the results of it. So we have our two pieces unsanded and sanded. So this is some rough sawn white oak that we purchased. I have a couple of pieces already milled, one edge, one surface and one edge. Let me show you how we do that on our Georgia. So here I am milling this oak board and the key on the Georgia is to get one face flat 
So we have a very light cut set for our jointer. So we don't waste any wood by overcutting something needlessly. So once you run it through uh, and get one face nice and flat, then you put that face up against the fence and you get one edge flat and parallel. And once you get that done appropriately, you always want to get your square out and you want to check it to make sure everything it meets your expectation. There we go. Here we are with our tabletop and we have it milled and ready to evaluate. We have selected the board's order of what sequence we want them in. Now we're gonna look and see that needs jointing there and that needs jointing there. We have done that one and that looks real good. We have marked our boards with little dots here because we're gonna joint both this edge and that edge. The one means we want this one to be jointed with this face in towards the fence and two dots means this face is outward facing when we join it. And the opposite, this will be in and out. So let's show you exactly how we do that. So we just have two gaps that we need to join. And you'll notice that I take the boards over and put the face either out facing or in facing to make sure the joint will match the mating piece. So we have our tabletop jointed. We know that these seams are nice and tight all the way across, but we have just a slight variation in height in a couple of these boards. And so now we're going to run them through the planer one final time to get them all precisely the same thickness. So we set our thickness planer up to the exact thickness that we need and run all boards through it to get the exact same size. Okay, so now we have all of our boards are precisely the same thickness. So we know we have any variation. It's due to our improper glue up. Okay, stay with me because we work fast. We put glue on the edges and get it all smeared out. We fold the edges over. We get them pushed together and push them together. We get the clamps on the edges and then we squeeze it and make sure they all fit. And we get other clamps on the edges, put a, a one underneath, put a collar on the top of it. And then we clamp that in, put more clamps on there. And then we scrape the glue off to make sure we get all the excess off. So now we have a glue up. So the bottom part of the glue up, we have a little drips on the thing. We're going to come in with our scraper and scrape the drips off. <laughs> then the last thing we do is square up the table by trimming the edges perpendicular to get it nice and square. Then we'll set the top aside waiting for further use. Today's tip is how to measure an acute angle. When you want to cut something along the line and you ever try using a speed square, it's awful difficult. I'm going to show you a quick shortcut how to determine that angle. So I've created a sample block here to replicate this angle. Now we're going to take this and determine what that angle is. First thing I'm going to do is turn on the laser cider and you can see that I have this red line right there and that'll help me determine this is where the cut would be if I were cutting something. But in this case, what I'm going to do is loosen up my angle. I'm going to turn my block over, and I'm going to turn this until this red line matches up with my preferred cut line, which is from that corner to right there. Turn your saw, you'll see that red line dance across there until it gets even with right there and you see that's the angle that you want to cut and so we have that at 27 degrees so once i know that one piece needs to be 27 degrees i proceed to cut a whole bunch of them to build me a frame to hold my lumber at that 27 degrees for a cut and the reciprocal of the 27 degrees so is 63 is degrees. Where this angle and this angle line up to 90 degrees when we put our board in there. We can cut it vertically this way. So my right side of my work holding will be the 27 degree angles. And so we screw in a piece of melamine into here to have a nice smooth surface so 
the long two by three boards will be able to slide smoothly along this as we cut it. So here's my completed jig for the bandsaw to cut my wedge pieces for my stretchers. That'll be the angular portion of the Celtic cross. So what I need to do now that I have this sled is about 44 inches long. This is approximately midpoint. So I need to cut away a groove in here or a slot up to the middle so I can have this thing rested up against the edge and make slide my piece in here. So this is the angle that I wanna cut. We built the sled so this is perpendicular to match the bandsaw. And this angle here is at 90 degrees. So after we cut this piece off, then we'll turn our board around. Oops, I think we need there. And cut item number two and then we'll have both pieces cut at our angle. Okay, now I'm ready to cut my first stretcher piece in this wedge pattern at that 27 degree angle. So I have my jig attached to the bandsaw Okay, so that cut went well. So now we have one side of our wedge cut. Now we do the same thing on this side and have a one inch flat spot in the middle. So I have my wedge cut. This is the part that will uh, be the bottom end or the edges of the cross. Now the next step in our table is to build the uh, bottom stand or carcass if you will. So we have the end apron along with our front and side front and back apron and we're going to use mortise and tenon. So on this piece here I've already cut a half inch tenon for this connect into the legs. So on the legs so I've gone ahead and marked on the legs where our apron will fit in. And so we'll have to cut these half inch mortises for the front apron and the end apron to fit there. It's time for my mortising jig to cut my mortises into my legs. So this is the top part. This is the uh, adjustment part. So here's the mortise I'm going to cut with the router. And this is three and a quarter inches. So I've marked a center point at one and five eighths, and this is a half inch. So in our jig, this center mark here is what we want the center mark to be. So we're going to move this over so that matches. So when I'm making my adjustments, I want the center line on my piece to be right with these crosshairs. And then to get the other line attached and align that center stripe with that right there, that way I know that I have this right in the center up and down. Now I can tighten it down. The length of the mortise is determined by the little blocks that have the little black knobs on it. To set that up, you put your router base, you measure if it's six inches and you want to cut an additional three and a half inches. So those guys will be nine and a half inches apart. And as long as they're centered, you'll have your mortise cut in the dead center of your spacing. Since I'm cutting a one inch deep mortise, it's important to cut it in multiple steps of a quarter inch or so and vacuum it out each time. That way the sawdust doesn't block your way. Make sure that you get your full width and depth of your cut exactly one inch. We have it. So that's three and a quarter inches. Half inch wide. Half inch from the edge right on target it's exactly what we wanted we'll take the tape off 
Isn't that pretty? Perfect. Exactly one inch depth. So once you cut a number of these mortises and you realize that all you need to do to measure is to have the center marked because the jig works on the center mark and everything else is controlled. So that's all I have marked on these two tenons is just the center marks and I line it up on my jig to the center mark and the width and the depth and the length of the mortise is already predetermined. So let's get this cut. Every time I use this Japanese pull saw, I just love it. It's a wonderful saw. So I'm using it to cut the tenons on the end of our apron pieces. After I cut the end pieces of the aprons, I go to the main pieces with all the inlay banding on it and get the tenons cut on it. Okay, to cut this, tenon to size. We've already made the cut in this way. Now we want to cut down. We use this edge to put our saw up against to know exactly where that's going to be. And we just draw backwards once, up, and then start sawing, keeping your finger up against here. Make sure your saw is vertical. As long as this side of the saw stays in contact with this lip, you'll have a nice, clean cut. There we go. One thing people are gonna be asking about, you have a mortise with rounded holes, you have a tenon that's got square corners. What do you do? Do you square the corners on the mortise or round the tenon ends? Simple question for me, which is fastest? Me? rounding the corners. Let me show you how we do it. I find the easiest way to round over the corners is to use our one inch belt sander. So we just put it on the edge and just pivot into the corner to get it nice and round. It makes easy work for this task, particularly as many corners as I have to do. 1.03, so we cut them to one inch knowing that we'd need to trim them some, so we need to trim them to the depth of the tenons. I mean mortise. And that tenon is gonna be 0.986. So here's a few photos of our dry fit so far together, what we have after we've assembled the table after cutting out our mortise and tenons to be customized for each one. Starting to look like a table. It's looking real good. So today's task is to fit these cross and the cross section into our leg end. So we have this temporarily held in here and we have a joint that is with a dowel. So the dowel the hole is drilled into here and it fits into here like that. And it's just tight enough to fit into there. So now that we have that piece fitted, we're gonna work on the cross section and we'll also have it drilled with dowel holes to hold it in as well. Now this part requires the most accuracy. It's fitting the dowel joints into the terminal parts of the cross into the end sides. I have to measure it precisely. I have to take it apart. I have to mark where I drill the holes for the dowel holes. I get them measured, I put it in, and then I do the other side to make sure I have the alignment correct on it as well. I use a dowel point to determine that exact location. I take it apart, I drill it, and then I put it back together again to make sure it fits. And I do that on three different occasions to make sure it's precise. Okay, so I finished the assembly with the dowel holes cut in our two sides and in the bottom on both pieces. And so now we're ready to start fitting the stretchers. So I go to the bandsaw to cut this dado in this wedged stretcher piece and I have a stop block set up at that one inch 
to make sure I don't go any further in with the dado because the cross will fit into that slot. Now I'm breaking out the little pieces that we cut with the bandsaw. This ended up being quite laborious. We got to figure out a better way to do this. Okay, so after I cleared it out after the bandsaw, so I have a few things in here, so we're gonna put it on the bandsaw and just do a drag cut on that to clean that out a little bit before chiseling. Cutting eight of these mortises into the end of these stretchers was going to take a long time using the bandsaw. So I made this jig to cut this with the router and that way it'll be a lot faster. Once we got the stretchers cut, we can do a dry fit on our end pieces to create the crosses with the wedge ends. A small 1 8 inch roundover smoothed out all the edges. Then we moved on to the glue up of our table base. Now we did inlay banding on the top of the table as well and rather than extend this video any longer I made a special video just on the inlay banding on the top. So please check that out in the show notes below or in the card above. To enhance our white grain of the oak we did a wipe on gel stain. With the Rubio I'm gonna use gloves <clears throat> I'm my Rubio Monocoat on my mix up in this cup. I'm going to spread it with this spatula, rub it in with the white Scotch Brite, and wipe it off with some rags. Okay, let's talk about finishes. So, we wanted something that would give the texture of the grain of this white oak a little bit of color. We did a lot of experimentation to find out, but what we liked was this uh, white gel stain from General Finishes. And we thinned it with 50% mineral spirits and then we wiped it on and then we used a mineral spirits in a rag to wipe it to just get an undercoat. So it, right now it just has a little chalky look feel but you can see on the table over there how we have a, a much brighter brown finish and that's because after the gel stain we came back and put the Rubio Monaco Pure on it to bring that natural honey color of the oak back up. So this is the perfect combination of what we want to have just the grain with the white tones in it and still have the pure honey and warmth of the white oak. Thank you. 